Church family, thank you for joining us uh, for this Connect Group video. We are continuing uh, kind of on our topic of messy relationships. Last week we talked about how love uh, affects messy relationships. And uh, today we will start in a Connect Group video that talks about the importance of encouragement uh, when, when in relationships as we kind of walk through life and having relationships. Um, one of the things the author kind of points out here are just daily chores that are, are sometimes required. Uh, in our lives, one of those things that <clears throat> that's required in in our lives that I hate. I mean, I just despise is laundry. I hate doing laundry. Like I, I'll wash the dishes, I will cut the grass, I'll scrub the the tile with a toothbrush. You know, whatever. I, I'll do I'll do all that. I just I hate doing laundry. Uh, finding all the misfit socks and somehow my socks are the ones that always get. Uh, lost. I think uh, my dog actually eats them. Um, just, just the, the monotony of folding all of those clothes. And then when you've done all of that, you still have to hang it all up and put it all in drawers only to be taken out and destroyed again and have to be washed again. Uh, as much as I hate it, the truth is it's necessary in my life, not just in my life, but in my family's life. I mean, if I didn't help do laundry and my kids were uh, their clothes never got washed. Uh, my children would be known as the smelly kids. Uh, and so we have to, you know, laundry is important. I have to do laundry. I have to help my wife do laundry and be sure that that gets done. It's just something that is required sometimes uh, at our house on a daily basis. Uh, and, and something else, as we are looking here at relationships and, and specifically messy relationships and how we can strengthen those, Something else that we need daily in our lives and others need in their lives is a, a daily dose of encouragement. Um, daily encouragement can help us spiritually, emotionally, can help us grow in so many different ways. We were, we were made as human beings to be in relationship. And so we are, whether we admit it or not, we are constantly seeking affirmation from those around us because we want those relationships. We need them. We were made to have them. Unfortunately, a lot of us are deficient in the area of encouragement. We don't receive much encouragement and we don't offer much encouragement. And so as we talk about encouragement, I want us to take a look at a man named Barnabas uh, that we'll find in Acts. We're going to be in Acts 9 and then also in Acts 11. And we're going to see he, uh, a man who had the gift of encouragement, who lived a life that constantly poured encouragement out on others. So we'll start in Acts chapter 9. Uh, starting in verse 26 and 28, it says, When he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Some things are, are better caught than taught, right? That's the old saying, that some things it's easier just to see them happen than to just be told how to do them. I think that that's one of the reasons why YouTube is blown up as big as it has. You're, may, you may be watching this video on YouTube right now. Very likely later on today, or maybe you already have earlier today, watched our live service on YouTube. If you scroll through YouTube, if you just type in how to in the search bar, you're going to come up with thousands, if not if not millions, of videos on how to do different things. I mean, you can become an expert at almost anything today. There's been a number of times in woodworking and mechanicing that I, I didn't know how to do something, so I just went to trusty YouTube to figure it out. And the great thing about YouTube is not only are you given instructions on how to do something, but you can watch someone else do it. And it just, again, it ties to that old saying that some things are better caught than taught. And I think that's exactly what we see here beginning to happen in this passage. Barnabas is proof of that. Barnabas is proof that some things are better caught than taught. So Paul has become a believer, but the Christians, they are not believing anything that he has to say, right? I mean, he's been known as someone to murder Christians, who's jailed them, who's, who's been persecuting them for, for some time. But Barnabas, he's someone worth watching, isn't he? He's someone worth catching something from, isn't he? Because he he sees Saul and he decides that he's going to encourage him. And, and he really gives us 
three ways of giving him that encouragement. And the first one that we're going to look at is how we can encourage people by acceptance. Again, Saul has been completely pushed away, pushed out by the believers there, and, and they're scared to death that, that he's just trying to infiltrate them to figure out who they are so he can take them all down. But Barnabas sees Saul. He sees who, who Christ has made him. And so he comes along Saul and encourages him. He encourages, he encourages him in his faith. He encourages him to walk with Christ. He, encur- he encourages him when no one else will encourage him. And not only does, does Barnabas accept Paul and encourage him in that way, he also vouches for Paul towards others. So he encourages them uh, through that vouching for Paul, saying, hey, look, look at this man. Look what Christ has really done. You don't have to be afraid. Christ has done a mighty work in this man's life. He vouches for Saul and makes helps make that connection between Saul and and those the, the Jewish believers. And, and where would we be today if it were not for Barnabas? Where would, where would the gospel have gone if it were not for Barnabas? We, we often think of Paul and his great work to bring the gospel to the world. But the reality is, if it were not for Barnabas, the encourager, then none of that would have happened. And, and Barnabas, that, that name, I mean, this was no surprise to the people who were there. Barnabas, actual, his actual name was Joseph. Joseph of Cyprus, we see in Acts 4.36, but the word Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so he was so much known for encouraging the people around him that that actually became his nickname, that that they would look at him. Anytime they thought of encouragement, they would think of Joseph of Cyprus, so they called him Barnabas. And I think there's something that we can catch here, and, and that is that we can be encouraging to other people by accepting them. They may be different from us. They may have lived very different lives from us, but you never know the difference that you can make in a person's life when you're willing to step out of your 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 comfort zone, when you're willing to step out of your little box that you live in and offer encouragement to people or to, to the people around you. So I think the first thing that he talks to us about in encouragement is to encourage people with acceptance. And so the author gives us a couple of questions that we can look at. So I want to read out them, read them, and then you can discuss them. Keeping in mind that this is our student book, so sometimes uh, the questions are geared towards that. Uh, first question, when have you felt like the new kid on the block? Uh, and so when is a time when you were coming into a situation and you didn't know anyone, you felt like you were the new person, you were the person who was trying to gain acceptance? And then second of all, what risks do you take when you put yourself on the line for an outsider? So I hope that those questions did a couple of things. One is I hope maybe that first question helps helps you build a little empathy for those people who may be the new kids on the block as it kind of reminds you of a time when that may have been you, a time when you were longing for needed acceptance and, and maybe someone came along and accepted you. They gave you encouragement. And then the second question is uh, as you gain that empathy, to you can kind of begin to weigh the risks reward. So sure, there are there are risks um, to reaching out to the out to an outsider, but think of the rewards that exist that existed for you when you were the new kid on the block and someone reached out to you. Think about the acceptance and, and how that felt for you. And so you can weigh those two. And my hope is that as you weigh those risks versus rewards, that you see that it is it is much more rewarding to be accepting of others and to offer encouragement to them. So we'll we'll continue here. We're going to flip over to Acts chapter 11 now, looking in 21 through 24. It says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Large numbers of people were added to the Lord. So uh, a second lesson that Barnabas teaches us here about encouragement is, uh, so obviously the first one that we can encourage through acceptance, but also that we should encourage people to grow. So there is this church, right, that is beginning to grow exponentially. And as it grows, the Gentiles are even coming to faith. And so Barnabas is commissioned to travel 300 miles to go as as far as to Antioch, right, as far north as, as Antioch. Uh, so, cause so many, uh, people had come to Christ. And so as he goes, he, he's wanting to report back to the church 
what's going on. When he goes, he sees that these people are truly converted believers. They truly are growing in a relationship with Christ. And so as he sees them, he encourages them. It says that uh, it says when he arrived he and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. He wanted them to, to remain true to the Lord. And, and there's some context here that's important to understand. See, these people here in Antioch, they would be persecuted heavily. Uh, they would face a great famine. Many of them, those who were Jews, were would, would essentially be denying everything that they had ever been taught about what uh, being a follower of God was. And they were going uh, to become followers of Christ, which which we know is the Son of God, right? But they would have been raised in the Jewish faith, and they were uh, essentially denying what they were being told and, and accepting to follow Jesus. And then those who were Gentiles who had come to Christ, and there were many at this point. And, and so those who were Gentiles, as they came to Christ, were denying their pagan beliefs, would have been uh, ostracized by their families. And so they're being pushed away by those that they love. They would face persecution. They would face famine. And so Barnabas is encouraging them to continue to grow in their relationship with Christ, to continue to press forward, even though the, even though these times may be difficult. Um, and, and I think about the the strength that Barnabas must have had, uh, the, the faith that he had. I mean, I, uh, Barnabas is a man who himself would be persecuted. Barnabas was a man who would be ostracized by many, who would face horrible, horrible circumstances, sometimes even to the point of violence. Uh, and, and so Barnabas, this man who, who I would think he must need encouragement himself, uh, he offers it to others. Even though he may be empty or, or starving for encouragement, he continually is, imploring, is pouring encouragement out to those younger believers all around him. And, and so you may find yourself in a similar season right now. I know with COVID-19, for sure, we are we have been physically isolated from uh, our church family, from so many that we love. And we can find ourselves uh, in a place where we really are just starving for encouragement. And so I would just encourage you uh, to be Barnabas, to, to be like Barnabas, you know, to continually even though, even though sometimes we feel empty to, to pour out encouragement on those around us, because if you feel empty, then you got to believe that those around you do too. And, but don't just stop there. I mean, pour out encouragement on other people, but also pray that God would place that encourager in your own life, that person who would push you to be devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to stay true to him, to strengthen your heart as Barnabas strengthen these people to continue to grow in your relationship with him. And sometimes that, that is really what we need. We need someone to come and encourage us to grow. We know we should. We know how. We just need someone to, to give us an extra shove. So let's ask God to put that person in our life. So let's also be that person for those around us. Because I believe that even though it can be difficult to pour out whenever we aren't being poured into I still believe that you can be blessed through that. So three questions that I want you to kind of talk through as a group. Uh, one, how do we intentionally grow into the role of an encourager? Also, what role did encouragement play in the church at Antioch? And then finally, when have you been blessed through the encouragement of others? Take a moment, look at those questions, and then come back to the video and we'll finish this up. So just taking a look at those three questions. The first one, how do we intentionally grow into the role of encourager? And I think this is kind of multifaceted, but it's but it's not hard. It's not difficult per se. It just takes effort. I think the first thing we do to grow to grow into the role of encourager is to ask God that you grow into the role of encourager. Ask him for guidance in that and ask him for people to encourage. Uh, if we are intentionally asking God for those people to encourage, he's going to place those people in our lives, but also uh, he's going to help us with the next step is, is that we're going to begin to be more intentional uh, at looking for those people. If we're asking God for those people, then we're going to be looking for those people. And then part of looking for those people is to look at them empathetically, right? Uh, to, to empathize with their situation, to hear what they have to say. That doesn't mean that sometimes, you know, if they put themselves there, it doesn't mean that you don't sometimes speak some hard truth, but 
putting yourself in other people's shoes is a key to being an, an encourager to them. You know, remembering a time when you've been in that situation or trying to imagine being in that situation. Empathy is a huge part of being an encourager. So we ask God, we look uh, for those people, we empathize with those people, and then we, we have to be willing to step out. Uh, sometimes we see people who need encouragement. We begin to empathize with them, but we realize that if we go say something, uh, then it could really uh, make things awkward, you know, for us to bring those things out into the open. And so we have to be willing to step out of that comfort zone and be willing to to make that be who we are. And what that does is it develops a reputation. People will know you as someone who is willing to step out and step into sometimes some awkward and uncomfortable situations for the sake of encouragement. And so we said, well, how do we get the role of encourager? I think if we do these things, then we develop a reputation as an encourager. That next question, we kind of talked about it in length here as we talked about this passage. What role, uh, what role did encouragement play in the church at Antioch? And so we know that the church in Antioch is going to face great persecution. They're going to face famine. And so uh, surely that encouragement helped them continue to grow in their relationship, to strengthen their hearts so that when those things came about, they could continue to persevere through. And then this final question, man, it's, it's, I could talk for an hour about this question. When have you been blessed through the encouragement of others? Uh, it's difficult for me to pin time, for me to pin down the many times that I've been blessed by the encouragement of others. I, I could name off names of youth pastors, of, of those who have discipled me, who have encouraged me so much. Um, but, but one, one thing that happened recently, that was such an encouragement to me. And I don't know if they know it or not. It was actually one of our students. Uh, I had to send out a message to our students, just kind of tell them, hey, unfortunately, so much of what we wanted to happen this summer was not going to happen. And we kind of feared that that might happen, but we were just hoping and praying that all those things would not be canceled. Uh, unfortunately, they were. And so I sent out a message to our church, uh, to our students and to our parents, informing them about those things that weren't going to be able to happen. And and one of our students, who I know was she, when she was so upset, I'll just tell you who she was. Uh, her name was Caitlin Ray. Uh, I like to call her Kay Ray. And um, you know, in this moment when I know she was upset, uh, and and she had every right to to sit in and just kind of uh, sit in a, a pile of ashes uh, in in a burlap sack. Uh, instead, she she chose to text me and say, "Hey, look, I, I know this is difficult, and I know you've worked hard to try and." Uh, create something great for us this summer. And this is not how you planned it, but thank you, Aaron, for all that you do. And we love you. And man, it, it was such an encouragement to me. You know, it, again, just a couple of weeks ago, one of our students encouraged me in, in that situation and it stood out to me. And, and so I hope that you can think of times when you've been encouraged. And on the flip side of that, I hope you can think of times when you've encouraged others. So let's continue in Acts 11, looking at verses 25 and 26, uh, it reads, Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So this final verse, it, it shows us this final way, this final lesson that Barnabas gives us in encouragement. So we encourage people in, accept it, in acceptance. Uh, we encourage people in growth. And then finally, that we should encourage people in service. Um, as Barnabas sees this church here in Antioch growing and, and, and needing more direction, instead of just doing that himself, he goes to Tarsus, he gets uh, Saul, or, or as we know, Paul, and he brings him back to Antioch. And it says for a whole year, they met with the church and taught in large numbers. And, and we've now seen this shift. I, I get really excited about this because this is my hope as a minister. Uh, but we see this shift from Paul being the, the pupil of Barnabas, the disciple of Barnabas, to now Paul being the peer of Barnabas. And, and we don't know what Barnabas said to Paul, to, but, but we do know that now Paul and Barnabas are serving together. Barnabas has, seen, has caused Saul to grow in his faith, later to be called Paul, has caused him to grow into his faith, and now is serving alongside him teaching these young Christians how to grow in their faith. It's a disciple who made a disciple, and now they're working side by side, making 
disciples. What what an awesome picture. What this is a picture of exactly what, what how Christ desires that the gospel would grow. Uh, even here in our own church, it, it's not that, that we shouldn't just come to church to hear some good stuff and then leave, right? We should come with the desire to grow so that we can so that then we can serve just as we are being served. Uh, what an encouragement uh, that that uh, that as we grow, that we can serve alongside one another. And so as we encourage other people, as we accept them, as we watch them grow in their faith, it doesn't need to stop there. We too need to encourage them to serve. And part of encouraging people to serve is being willing to serve alongside them. You can tell someone to go serve all day, but if you never join them in service, it's probably not going to happen. And so can I just call you to look at opportunities of how you can encourage others in service. Mom, dad, uh, uh, grandma, grandpa, get your kids, get your, your grandkids. Let's, let's not just tell them how to serve. Let's join them in serving. Let's bake some cookies for, for someone who's shut in during this time and just show them some love. Let's pick up some groceries for someone. When, when all this is over, let's look for opportunities to love on people in our state, to love on people in our community. And let's do that beside one another. Let's encourage each other to serve the lost and dying world around us. Because ultimately, our our, our goal is to see them too come to Christ. I, I hope that you've enjoyed our look at encouragement and how it can help us in messy relationships. I have a few questions I want us to look at, and then there will be some Christ and cultural questions that will show up on the screen that you can continue if, if you want to kind of continue in study. So these questions are, uh, what are some things that might get in the way of people using their spiritual gifts in the church? What are some things that kind of keep us from using our spiritual gifts? Also, what might hold us back from encouraging others? And then finally, how can we actively encourage others to use their spiritual gifts? So uh, take a moment, look at those questions, and then when we come back, we'll take a, a brief look at those And then we'll give you some more that you can kind of have for continued study. So looking at those questions, what are some things that might get in the way of people using their spiritual gifts in the church? I think one of the biggest things that gets in the way of people using their spiritual gifts in the church is themselves. They they just don't want to do it. Uh, it's, it's a fear of not being accepted. It's a fear of being made fun of. It's a fear of having to step out and, and be in front of someone or, or be responsible for something. What if it, what if it fails and then it looks like it's on me? And so I would just, uh, I just encourage you that, um, it's not really up to you whether something fails or not, right? Uh, the Lord is working in all of those things. He just asked that we be obedient. And so, uh, if you know what that spiritual gift is, if you see a place where you can serve, Jump in and serve and trust that the Lord's going to do uh, what he wants with your gift. You know, what he's going to do, what he wants with how you're serving. So a second question there, what might hold us back from encouraging others? Um, and, and I think this is kind of tied to that first question. I think one thing that holds us back from encouraging others is is we just don't think about it, you know, um, or we, we expect some sort of perfection that's that's just not realistic. And but I think something else that holds us back from encouraging others or asking them to jump in and serve alongside of us. And I see this time and time again in the church is sometimes uh, maybe maybe we've been doing one task for so long and, and it's just kind of what we're good at. You know, that's our wheelhouse. And and if we let someone come in and do it with us, well, you know, they might mess it up. They might mess up everything that we've worked so hard to, to attain. And, and that's why we see ministries that were started so many years ago begin to die because not because they're bad ministries, but because they, they won't allow anyone else to come in and be a part of them because they might mess them up, you know? And so one of the ways that we can keep from that from happening is being willing to give up ownership of things, being willing to, to allow some things to fail and let some people come be a part of what's going on so they can grow and that they can learn. Uh, and so, so what holds us back? Sometimes it's our own pride that holds us back. Our own desire for what we call success holds us back from really discipling and growing people. And then that final question, how can we actively encourage others to use their spiritual gifts? And I think that ties back to the question we talked about earlier of how we can become 
uh, how we can gain the role of an encourager. And, and part of that is just actively looking for those people and looking for their spiritual gifts, but then giving them bite-sized pieces where they can begin to use it. You know, if, if you see someone with, with the gift of teaching, don't uh, immediately throw them into teaching your Sunday school class, you know, but give them opportunities to speak up in the Sunday school classes. Encourage them to maybe pull a couple of people aside and go a little bit deeper and you grow them and you grow that gift and you give them an opportunity to kind of to kind of move into that situation, you know, and you never know uh, who that person might become, who, who God may use them to be. And I hope that that's that that's an encouragement to you. You know, sometimes we think that the work we're doing is pointless and there's no reason to teach this person up this thing. Nothing's ever going to come of it. And, and well, that's a really bad attitude to have. Right. Because we need to do it out of obedience. Also, keep in mind that you don't know who this person may become. You don't know how God may use them to further his gospel all over the world. I, I think I've said here before, one of the prayers that I, I pray every night over my children is that God would use use my children to share the gospel. And, and I say, Lord, I pray that many people would know your name because of your work through them. And so I am hoping and I'm putting my trust in Jesus that he's going to use my children to spread the gospel all over the world. And so that means that I've got to do my best to, whether I know it's going to happen or not, I've got to do my best to disciple my children and raise them up and encourage them in service. So I, I and I hope that you will have that same encouragement of your children, of your grandchildren. That you'll have that same encouragement of your friends, of those people who look up to you, of people in your church, young people in your church. I hope that you will take on that role of encourager. Not just because uh, it's not just because uh, it's we should not just because we should do it out of obedience, but because we truly desire for the gospel to be spread all over the world. You may feel like your part is small, but just like sometimes we may forget about Barnabas here. But without the work of Barnabas, we wouldn't have the work of Paul. And so let's go. Let's be sons of encouragement. Let's go be Barnabas. Let's go be people who encourage those around us. Thank you for joining us. There's going to be a few more questions that you can look at. And I hope that you will take a moment, pause on those questions and discuss them as a family. More than anything, church family, we want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you. Thank you.